For squads of soldiers holding a defensive line or probing the enemy's line, firing a million dollar missile to take out a small drone is just not a practical solution. So the army has been busy testing out more realistic ways to keep soldiers safe and they're calling it Project Flytrap. Defense companies, both large and small, and Pentagon leaders have been busy building new microwave weapons, cheaper missiles, and other large solutions, but at the squad level, those guys are still pretty vulnerable. Welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm Kyle, and today we will be talking about the Army's efforts to build a layered, low-cost, and rapidly deployable counter drone system that they're calling Operation Flytrap. We will break down the tech, tactics, and the procedures being taught to soldiers to give them a fighting chance against these small drones that are just wreaking havoc on battlefields across the world. Flytrap started as a soldier-led innovation project inside of the Army's Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, or RCCTO. Instead of developing one new fancy, expensive silver bullet weapon like the Pentagon is one to do, Flytrap combines a variety of tools, many of them commercial or non-program, into a modular anti-drone toolkit. It is being designed with lessons from primarily Ukraine in mind. Years of watching cheap, ultra-maneuverable drones behave like guided missiles as they take out entire dugouts and main battle tanks has forced planners to face a hard truth. You can't just shoot shoot one of them down and think the problem is solved. These drones typically work in teams with sometimes dozens waiting for the opportunity to strike from all angles. Now we're even seeing that some are being left on the ground as part of a lurk and strike tactic. To stand any chance against this onslaught, you need a layered defense that includes radar, jamming and electronic warfare, kinetic interceptors, and fast decision-making tools. Getting all this put together is not a simple thing, so with the latest version of Flytrap 4.0, they field tested it as part of Defender Europe 25, which is a NATO exercise in Poland, and this time it involved US and British soldiers. Before we get started, we want to thank Odoo for sponsoring today's episode. If if you're still managing your business with a mess of spreadsheets, sticky notes, and a patchwork of apps, stop the chaos. Odoo brings it all under one roof with a unified business management system that covers everything from sales to shipping to the shop floor. Odoo gives you full control over inventory and manufacturing from a single dashboard. You can track receipts, deliveries, point of sales orders, and work orders in real time. You'll see exactly what's moving, what's delayed, and what needs attention. You can automate vendor reminders, schedule shipments, scan components with a mobile bar code app and update worksheets or bills of material on the fly. Whether you're running one warehouse or 10, Odoo keeps your operation fast, accurate, and fully connected. The best part though, everything talks to everything. Sales, e-commerce, CRM, inventory, manufacturing. It's one connected system, not a Frankenstein of bolt-on. So if you're done taping your business together with whatever software you can find, head over to odoo.com. Your first app is free. No trial, no credit card, no nonsense. You've got a business to run, let Odoo make it easier. Defender Europe 25 is one of the largest NATO exercises of the year. The point of Flytrap 4.0 wasn't just to see if the gear worked, it was also to see if soldiers with minimal prep could use it effectively in a real world scenario. After all, simple solutions really aren't simple if they take weeks of training to use effectively. The primary testing units fell under US Army Europe and Africa Command and belonged largely to the 3rd Infantry Division. These soldiers were responsible for integrating Project Flytrap across rotational forces and serving as the operational testbed in theater. The British Army 7th Light Mechanized Brigade Combat Team, known for its expeditionary focus and rapid reaction capabilities, also took part. This unit worked alongside US elements to test interoperability and layered defense tactics. 
U.S. Army's Future Command and the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, the RCTTO that we already mentioned, were also there and both were involved in system selection, capturing that sweet data and coordination. And lastly, the Joint Counter Small Unmanned Aircraft Systems Office, or for short JCO because that makes perfect sense, was also there. They oversee the doctrinal and technical validation for counter drone integration across the the services. These groups and soldiers conducted drills that simulated actual battlefield conditions, including drone swarm attacks with multiple simultaneous threats from all different directions and altitudes, pop-up FPV attacks replicating what troops have faced in Ukraine using small quadcopters for kamikaze strikes, GPS jamming and denial environments where some radar and command and control systems were limited or degraded, and payload diversity including simulated ISR platforms, which again are intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance platforms, munitions bearing drones, and decoys. The goal was to stress the full spectrum of defense, from early detection to final defeat, using gear that troops had to learn, adapt to, and operate under pressure. Each engagement was designed to require rapid decision making, forcing troops to determine if it's best to jam the drone, intercept it with something like another drone, or take the shot from a shotgun or a rifle before it was too late. The exercise measured not just technical performance, but also how quickly junior leaders and operators could incorporate the systems into their battle rhythm. This wasn't limited to tech specialists and other people like that. Infantry, scouts, and support personnel all took part in handling the systems, offering critical user feedback. That feedback loop, being a soldier-driven adaptation, is what sets Flytrap apart from most top-down acquisition efforts. It's gear being shaped by the people who will actually depend on it, and since there's not a massive defense contract at stake, at least not yet, maybe the generals and industry representatives will actually listen to the troops testing their things. Before you can disable a drone, you need to know it is coming and be able to see it. The Army has been experimenting with multiple systems, but they didn't specifically name any for Flytrap 4.0. However, imagery from the exercise shows compact radar and optic systems deployed on tripods, consistent with systems in this class, so we will discuss some of those. The Echo Shield system by Echodyne was shown atop a striker at the exercise. This small array delivers full hemispheric coverage, which is just a fancy way of saying it scans 360 degrees, and that was to detect all threats, including small drones. The panels can also be employed individually and at just about 35 pounds each could theoretically be carried by a squad, depending on their ability to generate power. The Rada RPS-42 radar, now part of Elbit Systems, is a compact hemispheric radar system that fits on a tripod and provides 360 degree coverage. These can be found on the Marine Corps' Mattis and El Mattis systems, and it tracks small UAS targets with low radar cross sections, detecting threats out to five kilometers depending on the drone profile. The whole system itself weighs in at just 105 kilograms. I say just because you gotta remember, this is a full-fledged radar and that's about 230 pounds. So while it may not be practical for a fire team to carry one on patrol with the five kilometer or a 3.1 mile range, they can push out a little way and still have eyes on the sky. Electro-optical and infrared or EOIR sensors like the Teledyne FLIR HRC system are used for day and night visual tracking and confirmation. Against the sky, a lot of these small drones are just invisible to the naked eye, but these systems can see both the electromagnetic and the heat signatures of anything coming at them. If those fail to see them, you might be able to hear them coming, so they're testing acoustic sensors for passive listening when radio or GPS denial is in effect. Ukraine has developed and employed a system called Sky Fortress, which has networked listening stations dotted all over that cost under $1,000 each, and they can listen for drones, missiles, and other threats. They then relay this information to anti-drone gunners who then ambush the targets. 
The US has had its eye on this specific system for a while now, but in Flytrap, they put to the test what they call Skyview using the square head acoustic panel. These passive detectors can be easily concealed, are relatively lightweight, and as we said already, they're passive, so they're harder to detect. Like the RPS-42 radar system that we just mentioned, Skyview can also be found on the Mattis. Information from these systems and more systems like them feed into a central software interface and, well, the Android Tactical Assault Kit, or ATAC, wasn't officially named, it is the Army Standard C2, and that's Command and Control, tool used across dismounted and small unit formations, and is likely the framework used to display the threat map and direct engagements using the information from all these systems that they're testing. Once you do manage to detect a drone, the cheapest, safest, and often most effective way to disable it is to just jam it. Photos and videos from the exercise show dismounted soldiers using rifle-style jamming devices, suggesting the use of commercially available or off-the-shelf directional jammers. One system that was shown being used is the Night Fighter S, built by Steel Rock Technologies. This is a man-portable tool that weighs about 37 pounds and works by disrupting the control signals, both in 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz bands, as well as the navigation system, forcing the drones to return home and potentially betraying their operator's location or just simply crash. This has a range of up to two kilometers, but currently it only runs for a little over an hour off the battery, which is an obvious limitation, one that can't easily be overcome with more batteries. But as we've discussed multiple times, Soldiers have a ton of batteries, and those get pretty heavy. U.S. troops have also been seen with several rifle-like jammers, including the drone gun, both the tactical and Mark IV variants from Drone Shield, as well as the Drone Buster and the Drone Defender, just to name a few. There's more, but these are the big ones. These are shoulder-fired devices that jam GPS and control signals within a few hundred meters. Like the Night Fighter, these can trigger drone fail-safe modes like return to home or just straight crash it. Soldiers were also spotted wearing both the Wingman Drone Detector and the Pitbull Personal Drone Jammers, which work together. These radio-looking devices do just as they say. The Wingman detects the drones, and the Pitbull jams them without all the bulk. This sort of wearable and lightweight technology will be vital as formations return to more dispersed operations, much like how it was in the global war on terror when IEDs were ripping people apart. Troops are having to spread themselves out more to limit damage from hits. Having to disperse more widely obviously puts soldiers and others like Marines and Airmen, Sailors, whatever, Space Force Guardians, I don't know, in kind of compromising sitting duck positions where they're 20, 30 meters away from somebody else. This, as we've seen in Ukraine, is usually a very juicy target for an FPV drone operator. So these little jammers give those lone soldiers that are out there just trying to hide in the brush a fighting chance to detect and jam these drones. Just simply having the jammers though is not enough, and so soldiers also trained on when to use them and when not to. Jamming, as you can probably guess, is mostly a two-way street, and you can interfere with friendly signals, so coordination is key. If jamming fails, or if it is a fiber optic drone that's impervious to jamming, you need to shoot it down, and that is easier said than done, but it is a vital capability that our troops just have to have. At Flytrap, soldiers were seen with rifles outfitted with the Smash 2000 Smart Optic, which has been tested going back to 2020 and beyond, and in 2024 it was chosen by the Marine Corps as a way to defeat small drones. In the comments, we usually see people say things like, why not just shoot them down with their rifles, and yeah, duh. But that's easier said than done, and usually when you say that, everyone else knows that you've never fired a rifle at anything that posed a threat to you. So let's just kind of back it up there. The Smash does a whole lot of math to all but lock on to a target and send the round down range when a hit is most likely. As we've said, hitting a small drone at any sort of a distance with a rifle isn't easy, but this increases the odds of a hit greatly. 
They also tested shotguns as a defense of last resort because yes, shotguns can take out drones that are close, but if you don't take them out far enough away, they can still potentially do damage. Number nine birdshot isn't quite cut out for this and double op buck doesn't give the spread you'd want, but rounds like the Skynet give you a better chance. Let's pray to God this works. Skynet defense system. This is not to be confused with the Skynet that assumes control of our nuclear devices and kills 3 billion people, triggering Arnold Schwarzenegger to be sent from the future to try to murder a child. These are just simple shotgun shells that fire a 5 foot wide net that can take a drone out up to 420 feet away. The Army has also been testing drones to intercept other drones. In one video posted recently by the 173rd Airborne Brigade Combat Team, a drone armed with the Claymore mine is unleashed on a target drone, shooting it down. As we have seen in Ukraine and now elsewhere, drones are increasingly being used for interception, whether as hit-to-kill vehicles or by carrying shotguns or other form of offensive measures, and now Ukraine is packing them with lots of shotguns. Each of these methods has trade-offs, and yes, the soldiers on the ground will have to make these decisions with those variables very rapidly, so in Flytrap they trained with decision making under time pressure, which system to use, when to use them, and all those other variables based on drone type, proximity, and of course, everyone's friend, rules of engagement. The Army knows that high-end solutions like lasers and microwave weapons won't be available to every squad, convoy, or checkpoint. Flytrap gives commanders a menu of tools and other things that they can tailor to their AO, and of course the soldiers can also inform those decisions. It gives troops an ability to detect early, jam first, and shoot only if they have to. These systems are cheap, scalable, and field tested now by the troops who will actually potentially use them. Flytrap 4.0 is not a perfect fix, it is still very much a work in progress, but it is putting practical and effective tools in soldiers' hands at the small unit level, and that's not really something we would have been able to say a few years ago. I wrote this script and Savvy edited the video. Today, once again, I'm wearing the Grenade Patton t-shirt, which I've dumped a fair amount of sweat into because it's friggin' hot in my office today. I don't know how to explain it, but I'm sweating real bad. Anyways, it does a great job absorbing sweat. It looks pretty good, the print's great, and if you watch this point, you can buy it using a code actually watched to get 10% off. Other than that, that's all I really got for you. I'm Kyle, your friendly ginger producer man. You are all dismissed, and I'll see you next time.